Hello everyone. I welcome you to today's webinar on the genomics of breast cancer. Cancer is a genetic disease caused by acquired or inherited mutations in genes that control the way how cells grow and multiply. In today's session, we have Ms. Asta Watsyayan, who is going to talk about how founder mutations in specific populations predispose a carrier to breast cancer and what that can mean for screening. Ms. Asta has completed her B.Tech and M.Tech in Biotechnology from Amateur University, Uttar Pradesh, and she is currently pursuing her PhD in Dr. Vinod Skaria's lab here at CSIR IGIB. Her main area of focus is to study hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndromes. I welcome you, Asta, and the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, Mercy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on genomics of breast cancer. Today, we'll be talking about founder mutations, predisposition, and screening. Now, let's look at the global picture of breast cancer. As we can see, it's one of the most prevalent forms of cancer all across the world, second only to lung cancer. 15% uh, of all cancer deaths in women are also attributed to breast cancer, as well as 25% of all new cancer cases are breast cancer cases. This makes it one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in women globally. Now, to understand breast cancer further, let's look at what cancer actually is. At the core of it, cancer is a genetic disease which is caused by mutations in genes such as oncogenes, tumor suppressors, etc. Now, 5 to 10% of all cancers are heritable in nature and form a part of familial cancer syndromes. So, some of these mutations are actually passed down across generations and they form a part of familial cancer syndromes. Now, what a familial cancer syndrome does is that it uh, puts a person at an increased lifetime risk of getting a specific group of cancers, typically till the age of 70 years. So for instance, if you look at hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome or HVOC linked with BRCA1 gene, we see that a carrier of uh, pathogenic mutations would have an up to 87% risk of getting breast cancer and up to 7% risk of getting pancreatic cancer. The carrier can get any or all of these cancers as well as multiple family members of the carrier would also typically present with uh, one or more of these cancers. Now, HPOC is not the only uh, breast cancer syndrome. There are several. Uh, uh, HPOC itself is linked with BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, along with this, there is also Lee Fromini syndrome, which is associated with P53 and CHECK2 genes. Uh, in this, uh, apart from breast cancer, a patient can also develop soft tissue sarcoma, osteosarcoma, leukemia or lymphomas, brain tumors, as well as kidney tumors. There is also Cowden syndrome, which is linked with P10 gene. And apart from breast cancer, it is also linked with ovarian or endometrial cancer, kidney and thyroid cancers. And of course, there is ataxia telangiectasia, which is linked with ATM gene, which can also lead to leukemias and lymphomas and thyroid cancer apart from breast cancer. Now, how do we identify familial cancer syndromes? Uh, we've already seen the first point. There would be a familial clustering of a syndrome-associated cancers. So for instance, in HPOC, multiple family members or the same family member would present with multiple cancers, such as breast, ovarian, prostate, and pancreatic. Cancers would be present in an opposite gender. For instance, male breast cancer, especially if it's a bilateral occurrence, which means that both the breasts are affected. The presence of multiple primary tumors, which could even be benign at the beginning. For instance, in case of familial adenomatous polyposis, uh, more than 100 adenomatous colorectal, uh, uh, colorectal polyps actually present in the patient. And if these polyps are not removed at this stage, when the polyps are still benign, there's a 100% chance that the patient will actually end up developing cancer. The presence of congenital or uncommon features, such as the presence of short stature in Fanconi anemia. Presence of rare cancers, such as adenocortical cancer in children in the case of Lee fromini syndrome. And most importantly, an earlier than typical age of onset. So for instance, uh, it would be around mid-teens when uh, the adenomatous polyps present in familial uh, adenomatous polyposis and at uh, breast cancer at less than 45 years of age in case of HPOC. Now to understand the mechanism of this, um, we have to go back to 1971 when Alfred G. Knudsen was performing statistical analysis on cases of retinoblastoma, which are linked with RB1 gene. He discovered that inherited retinoblastoma would occur at a much younger age and often would affect both eyes. Now, based on this observation, he uh, uh, hypothesized uh, that most tumor suppressor genes require both alleles to be inactivated to cause malign degeneration. What this basically means is that in case of sporadic form of cancer, both the parents pass on two healthy copies of the gene to the zygote 
and thus the child has healthy uh, copies of the gene itself. However, when the first mutational event or the first hit occurs, one allele is actually damaged, but the child is still healthy because the other allele is functioning. However, when a second mutational event occurs, it leads to retinoblastoma. In the familial form, however, one of the parents passes down a damaged allele to the child, which uh, in turn means that uh, a single mutational event or a hit can actually lead to retinoblastoma. Thus, an earlier than typical age of onset is observed. Now, in some uh, germline pathogenic variants that we study uh, as part of hereditary syndromes or otherwise, we observe that uh, they are present at a very high frequency in specific ethnic groups, resulting in a higher prevalence of a specific disease in that specific ethnic group. So, for instance, in individuals of African descent, there are several mutations that are uh, carried forward in individuals that are linked with sickle cell anemia. Therefore, there's a higher prevalence of sickle cell anemia in individuals of African descent. Similarly, there's a higher prevalence of deafness in individuals of Middle Eastern descent. This is because of something known as a founder effect. Now, a founder effect occurs when a small population is separated from a larger population, causing some of the uh, traits to be disproportionately represented in the new population. So if you look at an example here, uh, let's say that the different colors represent a rich genetic heterogeneity in the population. And let's say that the blue uh, color represents a cancer-associated phenotype. Now, if uh, a part of this population is isolated due to some reason, um, whereas the rest of the population continues, we will uh, now notice that after uh, multiple generations, we see that the general population still maintains its uh, genetic heterogeneity, uh, whereas the isolated population has a much higher number of individuals uh, with uh, cancer as compared to the general population, simply because the isolated population had a much higher uh, number of individuals uh, that had this phenotype. This is known as the founder effect. Now to uh, see founder mutations in the context of uh, hereditary cancers, if we talk about uh, BRCA1 uh, and BRCA2 variants uh, in the US populations, if we talk about the general population, we find that one in 400 individuals actually carry pathogenic or likely pathogenic BRCA variants, uh, either BRCA1 or to BRCA2 variants. However, this number drastically increases to about 1 in 40 individuals in the case of the Ashkenazi Jewish population. This is primarily because of the presence of three founder mutations at a very, very high combined carrier frequency of 2.5%. These are uh, the BRCA1, 195 Del AG, and 5382 INC uh, variants, and the BRCA2, 6174 Del T variant. So because these uh, variants are present at a very high uh, frequency in this population, the Ashkenazi Jewish population is at a higher risk at getting breast cancer as compared to the general US population. Similarly, several such studies have been conducted and several ethnic groups have been linked with specific uh, founder mutations, uh, such as Germans, Russians, Belgians, African Americans, and so forth. Now, if we talk about the genetics of founder mutation, founder mutations are a special class of genetic mutations that are embedded in stretches of DNA that are identical in all the people who have the mutation. This stretch of DNA is called a haplotype. Now, everyone with a founder mutation has a common ancestor, which is the founder, in whom the mutation first appeared. Uh, one important thing to note is that haplotypes get shorter over generations due to genetic recombination. Uh, we can see that here in this example. Uh, here we have a normal chromosome and an affected chromosome. Uh, the founder uh, undergoes a mutational event and now bears the mutation. Uh, after recombination, the carrier offspring now has a, a specific haplotype marked here in orange, which bears the founder mutation. Now, over several generations uh, and over several recombination events, the size of this haplotype continues to grow smaller, such that in the present day carrier, the haplotype size is much smaller than the carrier offspring had uh, right after the founder mutation had occurred. Now, by measuring the length of the haplotype uh, the uh, present day carrier has, the approximate age of the mutation can now be calculated and also the root of dispersion of the mutation across uh, generations right back to the founder can actually be calculated. This was in fact done by Diop et al. in 2022, wherein uh, they studied the C815824 uh, dope variant. Uh, this is one of the most frequent among the African-American populations with inherited breast cancers in the US. Uh, and then they uh, uh, did haplotype analysis and discovered that this variant was actually of West African origin. And due to uh, movement of, uh, of individuals, this uh, variant not only is present in the US as of now, but is also present in countries such as Peru, 
Mexico, the Bahamas, Spain, as well as France. Now, why should we study hereditary variants? What is the importance of them? In a single word, it would be described as screening. Now, we all know that early detection is extremely important in cancer. Uh, if you look at the five-year uh, relative survival by stage at diagnosis, if the diagnosis was made at a very early stage when the cancer was still localized, there's an almost 100% chance of, rel uh, of survival over the next five years. However, if the cancer was detected at a stage where it was already distant, which means metastasis had already occurred, the survival rate drops down to about 30%, which is a drastic drop. Therefore, early detection and early treatment of cancer is extremely important. Now, if a person knows that they are a carrier of such a hereditary variant that puts them at a very high risk of cancer, they can actually go in for increased surveillance, which means they can go in for yearly mammographies, MRIs, uh, CA-125 testing and so forth and catch the cancer early. Uh, they could also go in for uh, preventative strategies such as making lifestyle changes, such as uh, letting go of smoking, uh, uh, adopting a healthier diet, healthier exercise routine and so forth. Uh, they could also go in for surgical intervention if the doctor deems it fit. Uh, this was made famous, in fact, by the actress Angelina Jolie. Uh, so herein, uh, the patients can actually go for bilateral mastectomy or salpingo oophrectomy, which basically means removal of the breast or the ovaries or both, uh, based on what is indicated as uh, suggested by the doctor, such that the cancer never occurs in these organs. So the removal actually occurs before the cancer has a chance to strike. Also, in some cases, chemo prevention is possible in specific types of breast cancer by administering uh, proactively the drug tamoxifen or riloxifene. Now, this genetic screening would, of course, impact uh, entire families and eventually entire communities. Um, and eventually, uh, since the patient would be caught early, uh, their uh, financial burden as well as the financial burden of the government would be greatly reduced. Now, in terms of breast cancer genetics, it is, it is important to study these variants because the study of these variants actually helps us establish the prior probability of carrying a specific mutation in a specific population. And if a person has already uh, uh, been uh, confirmed as a carrier, it also helps us establish the likelihood that this uh, carrier would actually end up developing cancer. Also, since founder mutations are found in large families or large communities, uh, we can use these large numbers to our advantage and uh, do studies that involve uh, penetrance expression as well as the evalu uh, evaluation of uh, risk factors. Um, also, uh, uh, studying each of these variants, we can establish mutation-specific effects on the disease phenotype, so which mutation leads to what kind of phenotype and so forth. And also, uh, founder populations can be used to localize additional breast cancer susceptibility, susceptibility loci uh, since uh, there's a reduction in locus heterogeneity observed. In terms of screening, it is important to study these variants uh, because if we have an idea of what these variants are, we can actually, and which populations they affect, we can actually develop genetic screening uh, policies specific to populations or subpopulations. A prime example of this is that the National Comprehensive Cancer Network in the US actually recommends that a person of an Ashkenazi Jewish heritage uh, go in for uh, breast cancer testing at an earlier uh, age than what is recommended for normal uh, population. Now, uh, awareness of such uh, variations specific to these populations can also help us develop a preventative health strategy. So doctors and policymakers can actually sit down and uh, develop ways specific to a patient wherein they could, uh, in fact, prevent cancer from occurring. Uh, also, if we know which mutations occur uh, in a particular group of people, we could make rapid and less expensive tests that target specifically those mutations that are found in those people. So instead of uh, sequencing the entire genome or uh, all the genes that are associated with that particular form of cancer, we could just develop tests that actually look for these specific mutations in these individuals uh, that would make the test much more rapid and bring the cost uh, down. And this, of course, would uh, help entire families and communities uh, in early detection and thus catch cancer at a very early stage. Now, accurate variant uh, classification is the next step. Uh, genetic testing in itself is not enough. Uh, in order to be able to do something with the testing report that we get, we, we have to know whether a variant is actually pathogenic, benign, or of uncertain significance. We should only be able to take action if the variant is pathogenic and is linked with disease definitively. So to make this happen, uh, the ACMG AMP guidelines have been put in place by the American College of Mendelian Genetics and Genomics, along with the Association for Molecular Pathology, ACMG AMP. 
uh, these uh, guidelines apply, apply to all kinds of genetic tests. And what they basically do is that they help uh, classify a variant in one of five categories. So the variant can conclusively either be termed as pathogenic, likely pathogenic, of uncertain significance, benign or likely benign. Now, this is uh, extremely important. And to tell you how this actually works, uh, what ACMG AMP does is that it has different criteria which it uses to classify a variant into 28 attributes. So for instance, if you look here, the first, first criteria is population allele frequencies. If a variant is present at a greater than 5% allele frequency in a given population, then we can attribute, we can assign it the BA1 attribute. If it is present in uh, between 1 and 5% in a specific population, the BS1 attribute would be applied and so forth. This next criteria is computational data, wherein we look at pathogenicity prediction scores using software such as CIF, Polyphen, and CAD. And depending on what they say about a variant, for instance, if the majority of them say that this variant is pathogenic, we would uh, assign the variant the PP3 attribute. Else, we would assign the variant BP4 attribute if it is uh, uh, deemed to be benign by these softwares. The next criteria is uh, we look at what other well annotated databases such as ClinVar, PFAM, etc. have to say. For instance, if ClinVar says that a variant is pathogenic, we can give it PP5 uh, attribute. Along with these, one of the most uh, important uh, classification criteria is also literature screening, wherein we comb through all available literature uh, available uh, based on uh, the studies that have been performed linked with a specific variant. So for instance, if functional studies have been performed uh, that deem the variant to be conclusively pathogenic, we can give it PS3 attribute. Uh, this literature screening could also involve other kinds of studies such as segregation uh, data, whether a variant is segregating with the phenotype or not, what kind of a variant it is, whether it is nonsense, synonymous, novel, or compound heterozygous and so forth. And each has a, an attribute associated with it that we can give it. Now, at the end of the uh, literature survey, uh, what we do is we tally all the attributes that were given to a specific variant. And based on an algorithm that is given by the ACMG AMP, uh, we can finally determine whether this variant is classified as pathogenic BUS or benign. Now, uh, coming uh, to what work we have done in the lab so far, based on all the data that we've seen so far in the slides, um, we see that uh, we have a lot of data, a lot of information about what genetic variants are. Uh, uh, are involved in familial cancer syndromes or are founder variants in uh, a lot of other populations. However, this data is largely missing in the case of Indian populations and subpopulations, um, which uh, is extremely important to do since we have a very rich genetic diversity in our country. So to correct this, uh, we went back to the uh, Indigenomes database, which is part of the Indigen program, wherein uh, 1,029 self-declared healthy individuals from across the country in 27 states uh, gave their samples and uh, whole genome sequencing was performed on them. Uh, this uh, was a project undertaken by VS SSB labs at CSIR IGIB. Um, and uh, they actually calculated the allele count, allele frequency, and allele numbers for each of the variants that we were found in um, uh, these uh, self-declared healthy individuals. <laughs> now, uh, uh, in our lab, we went back uh, and we queried this data and we collected all the variants that were found across all breast cancer genes. Um, of these variants, we shortlisted six uh, high uh, penetrance genes that were linked with breast cancer. And among these, we annotated these uh, with ClinVar uh, uh, data and we actually collected all variants that were path pathogenic, likely pathogenic and conflicting in nature. Found about 67 variants and then we performed the ACMG classification for these. Uh, after we performed the classification, we realized that the vast majority of these variants, which is about 63% of all the variants that we uh, uh, collected, actually belong to BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Now, this isn't surprising since these genes are large in number and therefore have a tendency to collect more and more variants. Uh, but then, uh, based on this data, we actually uh, decided to focus on BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Uh, and we performed the ACMG of all uh, variants that were reported in these two genes as per the indigen data, which came to be about 1,909 BRCA1 and 1,500 BRCA2 uh, variants. Now, to supplement this information and to get a more holistic picture of what was going on in India, we also launched the BRCA Indica initiative, which is basically uh, an endeavor wherein we create a collaborative compendium by collaborating with uh, people across 
the country uh, who can give us variants uh, of these either of these two genes. So uh, anyone, any researcher, any doctor, uh, even a patient, anyone who has these variants uh, in form of a genetic testing report uh, who wants to share these variants with us can actually go ahead and share these variants as part of the BRCA Indica collaborative compendium effort. And we would collect the data anonymously, perform ACMG classification for these variants and share the data back with the uh, collaborators in question. Uh, this collaborative effort uh, can actually be found at guardian.genomes.in slash research slash Braca Indica and more information about this can also be found for anyone who may be interested in collaborating. This is an ongoing effort and the collaborations are still on. Now, based on the data that we had collected so far, we decided to form an ACMG qualified Braca compendium. Uh, the methodology uh, is fairly simple. We collected all the indigen variants that we had to perform the ACMG for uh, in BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. So it came to about 3000 genes. Um, we also collected all the variants uh, as per the BRCA Indica collaborative compendium effort. Uh, so we have about 46 variants that we have already performed the ACMG uh, AMP for uh, and more are on the way. We also collected uh, expert panel reviewed variants from ClinVar and are performing uh, a literature survey to con collect more and more Indi Indian specific variants. So as a result of this endeavor, we have a total of 10,265 BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants uh, as a part of a database right now. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the largest database that we have uh, globally, uh, which has variants in these two genes that have been ACMG AMP qualified uh, and presented. If you look at the breakdown, uh, we have about 2,245 pathogenic BRCA1 variants and about 2,687 pathogenic BRCA2 variants in the database so far. This is the uh, web interface of the database. The database is also called BRCA Indica. Um, and all the data is publicly available. Anyone can actually check out this data and check out their variants. However, the ACMG AMP classification for each of these variants is currently limited only to the collaborators who uh, are working with us on this database. So anyone who shares uh, their variants with us, uh, as we saw before, is actually granted access to all the variants, all the other variants as well that have been ACMG AMP classified. This database, uh, this uh, uh, website can actually be seen at clingen.igib.res.in slash Braca Indica. Now, given uh, the importance of ACMG AMP in testing, in screening, and in uh, uh, overall uh, tackling of uh, hereditary breast cancer, um, we have also launched an ACMG AMP online learning resource. This again is a collaborative uh, uh, initiative uh, brought forward by uh, uh, both VS and SSB labs. Uh, so uh, this initiative is called the Genomic Variant Analysis and Clinical Interpretation Course or the GBCI course. Um, as uh, of this year, as of 2022, in this iteration of the course, uh, that is this year's course. We already have more than 2,000 registrants across 40 countries. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, continually growing. Um, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only resource of its kind globally wherein ACMG AMP is actually taught online. Um, any, anyone interested can actually check out this resource at gvaci.genomes.in. Uh, the registrations uh, are either open or they would carry on to the next year. So any uh, interested student can actually enroll absolutely free of cost and learn how to perform ACMG AMP. Uh, this course is uh, ideally suited for either students uh, or clinicians or researchers who are interested in finding out how to actually accurately classify genomic variants, specifically uh, in uh, Mendelian disorders. Uh, next, uh, we come to the Guardian project. This, again, is a huge initiative uh, by CSIR IGIB and multiple uh, labs of uh, our institute are involved in it. Uh, Guardian stands for Genomics uh, for Understanding Rare Diseases India Alliance Network. It is um, a, a network that comprises of more than 250 collaborators and impacts 3,000 families across the country. And it is one of the largest rare disease genomics networks in India. Uh, what we basically do here is that we collect uh, 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 samples from uh, doctors. So for instance, let's say an oncologist uh, refers a breast cancer patient to us. So they would send a, a, a sample or we would collect a sample of the patient in question. We would perform next generation sequencing on the sample and we perform data analysis of the same. Uh, we would then uh, generate a report wherein we would tie the genotype with the phenotype. That is, we would tell you which uh, variant is likely to be causing the disease. Uh, and this would, of course, be ACMG AMP amplified in cases where it's required. 
uh, more and more uh, 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 doctors are actually coming on board every day. And if anyone is interested, they can actually find out more information on the same uh, on guardian.miragenome.com. This brings me to uh, the end of my presentation. I would like to uh, thank my principal investigator, Dr. Vinod Skarya, uh, for all his inputs uh, in my PhD. I would also like to thank uh, our collaborator, Dr. Sridhar Shivasubhu, and thank all uh, the current and past lab members of both the VS and SSB labs, as well as all patients and their families who have contributed their uh, data to us, their variants to us. Um, I would also like to thank uh, CSIR, IGIB, uh, CSIR, as well as ACSIR for making my PhD possible. Thanks a lot.